You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and we're back for another segment of the Opposition View. Joining me is none other than the brilliant Chris Wallace of the Gallagate Shots, another one of our 90 Min podcasts, one of the very best in the business. Chris, welcome back to the channel, mate. It's been a while. How are you? I'm not bad, mate. I'm, I'm a lot happier than what I was last time I was on the channel, I'll tell you that, um, <laughs> as people know why. Um, but, mate, I'm, I'm doing well. How are you yourself? Yeah, all good, man. All good. Having a bit of a, a crazy day. You got. A, I'm doing a couple of commentaries this week, and I'm trying to get prepared ahead of time for them, and it's just so time-consuming, just trudging through stats and facts and picking which ones you want to use and which ones you don't want to use and thinking, should I go this far deep into it? You never know. You might need yeah. it. And it just, yeah, that's I can it's see you've a, got a new wall as well, mate. I can see a new yeah. wall behind you. Yeah, we've got, yeah, it's a new wall. I've got a new desk. I've got new cameras. The camera, I haven't even set it up yet, um, which is awful of me. But we're getting there as well. I'm trying to make it look as impressive as your studio, but not quite there yet. <laughs> one day, one day. <laughs> one day, exactly. Um, Chris, lots and lots has happened in the world of Newcastle United since we last spoke on the show. Uh, obviously, the takeover's gone through. Mike Ashley is gone. The cans were out uh, up uh, in the Northeast, which is great news uh, for you guys. Before we talk a little bit about the team and, 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 of course, the new manager, I wanted to get your take on on how the wider world has reacted to the takeover, because I've got a few friends that are Newcastle United fans, and I was very much of the view that, OK, the the background of the people that have taken over the club is not squeaky clean. However, how many billionaires do have a squeaky clean background, number one? And number two, Newcastle United fans shouldn't be expected, in my opinion anyway, to be the moral compass of the people. You should acknowledge, I think, what they're, you know, what they've done in the past and, and what's been associated to them. But how irritating has it been as a Newcastle fan to hear everybody kind of slamming the takeover when for you guys it's such a positive thing? Yeah, I think we all expected, Harry, we, we knew what was coming our way. People forget that this takeover saga has been going for on around about three, four years now. It's been happening a long, long time. People just see it happen. It happened overnight when it's not the case, mate. It's, like I said, it's been going on for, for years upon years. And Amanda Stavies tried through multiple sources to, to get this takeover, not just through Saudi Arabia and PIF. Yeah, there has been other parties involved. Um, we knew. We knew what was coming our way we knew that we were going to get a lot of pressure as football fans and like you said mate we found it a little bit harsh on us as a fan base because we're football fans at the end of the day we're, we're the people that walk through the turnstiles put our bums on the seats and, and encourage our team to go forward and attack a goal and then hopefully get all three points at the end of the day i'm not sure why we should be this this moral compass now when you look at the, the government in this country they're happily arm and arm with Saudi Arabia. Why is it up to Newcastle United fans now to, to be like, hang on a second, maybe we need to stop this takeover from happening. Maybe we're so appalled by what's happening in Saudi Arabia that we shouldn't support this club anymore. That's not how life works as a football fan. We're there to support the club no matter what. And you're right what you're saying, mate. Yes, we have to educate ourselves as a as fan base in relation to what is happening or what has happened in Saudi Arabia. Um I was at the the overlap with uh, Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I was there the other week and Gary Neville summed it up perfectly. He said, everybody's looking at the past of Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia were always going to get a seat in the Premier League. It just so happens it's with Newcastle United because all the other big clubs, they've had their two over. They have their billionaire owners. So it was Newcastle United were, were always up there on the list. Um, Saudi Arabia come in and why can we not look forward? Why can we not try and force change in these countries by using the Premier League as that model? And why why can't we look towards the future rather than looking over the past and what has happened? Of course, people aren't going to be happy with it. I'm not overly happy with, obviously, the, the things which are, have happened in Saudi Arabia. But 
what am I supposed to do? Sati as a football fan. I'm 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 allowed to sit here and celebrate because Mike Ashley's gone. Like you mentioned the cans are out on Tyne side, mate. Can the cans are still on <laughs> Tyne side because Mike Ashley isn't there. It's we've waited 14 years for this moment. Let us enjoy it. The scenes outside St. James's Park when that takeover got announced, it was like we had won a cup. It's like we had won the Premier League. The fan base, and it still is to this day, we still haven't won a game. And there's still a, a an excitement in the air because it, it feels as if the shackles have finally been taken off this football club and we're in a pretty shitty position right now, sitting at the bottom of the Premier League. Of course we are. But despite that, I'm excited for the future of this football club and I haven't said that for a long time, mate. Yeah, and, and so you should be. So you should be. And and going back to that point, I you know, I've as I say, I know Newcastle fans. I've got a few friends that are very big Newcastle fans. And for me, one of them, you know, I think, Harry DeCosimo, the journalist. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and for him, I was, you know, and, and for you, of course, I was delighted when the takeover went through. And I kind of sat back watching the, the reaction to it from, you know, some parties and and listen a lot of them made valid points but i just felt that they needed to kind of differentiate their issues or the differentiate between having an issue with newcastle united and the fans who are celebrating this mm. because of you know of what it means to them and then also putting those other issues to, to the other side where you, you need to separate the two because like yeah. you say you're football fans you're not politicians you're not responsible for making changes in in other parts of the world and um and, and I think you know it's one of those things that it, people are always going to throw at you, people are always going to throw the mud at Newcastle off the back of this. But it's, it's always really going to be the same, Harry. It's it's always going to be the same for, from now on. In it doesn't matter what happens. It, this is it with this football club well, for the rest of its existence. If Saudi Arabia are still involved, and it got to the point where uh, you'll be the same way when things happen at Arsenal, you'll get the likes of the media outlets coming to you and saying, "Will, will you?" Um, come on the show and have an interview about the takeover. And it was at the point where I'd done a handful on the week of the takeover and it didn't seem I was getting the questions that football fans should be receiving. It was more what a politician should be receiving. Yeah. And it got to the point where we're getting these media requests where I'm openly saying to those, how many of the questions are going to be about Saudi Arabia and the, the human resource and the geopolitics in Saudi Arabia? Because if I'm not going to be at interviews as a football fan, I don't know why you're getting me on the show. And yeah. it just, it, it got frustrating. It, it really did, mate. But hopefully, hopefully that that's died down a little bit as a fan's point of view. Um, it, like we said, mate, it's not us. It's not up to us. It never will be. It never has been. And it, it's just like, mate, you look at the, the politics in this country and you had to have a Premier League footballer come out and get the likes of the school meals delivered to the kids during the summer holidays and things like that. Why is it always up to football to sort these out? Yeah, why? Why can the why can the politicians do it? Exactly. Why can't the people who are actually paid to do it do it? Exactly. Uh, man. Absolutely. Um, fast forward. There's been a lot of speculation about uh, who was going to take over the manager's position. It was pretty clear, wasn't it, that once the takeover was complete, that Steve Bruce's days were numbered. Rightly so, I think, when you look at mm. the results and the performances. Um, before you appointed Eddie Howe, who, of course, is is in the dugout now, well, wasn't in the dugout at well. the weekend, <laughs> but will be hopefully yeah. soon, uh, you were really heavily linked with Unai Emery. Now, mm. we know all about Unai Emery, and as much as I never felt he was the right man for Arsenal and the project that we had going on at the time, I never felt he was the right man to replace an institution like Arsene Wenger, if you yeah. if you like. I still think he's a very, very good coach. I still think he's a, a brilliant coach. Explain to me from a Newcastle perspective how you went from Unai Emery to Eddie Howe, because it's quite a drop-off with all due it's, respect to it. It's to not him. just from, from Emery to Eddie Howe, mate. Um, I think we've been linked with every single manager under the sun um, since the takeover was announced. It was Fonseca at one point. Um he was linked with it. Then the next minute, the, the reports were uh, Emery's done deal. Villarreal, obviously, they were watching the, the sorry, they had the Champions League game that night. And they said he's yeah. flying out to, to Tyneside tomorrow. And training's been put back till the afternoon so he can meet the players. And I think all the Tyneside watches that Villarreal game for some reason <laughs> when Emery was in charge. Um, but I think, I think what's happened, I think Emery's used Newcastle United to negotiate a better contract with Villarreal. I think that's what's happened. And I was in shock as you, mate. We, we even sort of, well, we were just about to do a podcast, really. We were arranging 
a podcast um, about Emery, just so we could get your take on it. And obviously, Eddie Howe was, was always linked. He always has been. Eddie Howe has been linked with this football club for, for years now, mate. Um, he's, he's somebody that fans have, have wanted to see take over at Newcastle United for a long time, especially while Steve Bruce was manager and Mike Ashley was still the owner of Newcastle United. I think things shifted slightly when obviously we got the the multi-billionaire takeover and obviously we became the, the richest club in the world is what people are keep referring us to now. So people, I think a lot of the fans really mocked that appointment with Eddie Howe and him coming in. But as much as a great coach Emery is and the, the trophies and the titles which he has won, then, then fair enough. But was he really the right man to take over a Newcastle United, a Newcastle United that was sat in the relegation zone. Um, to, to me, and the things which we've heard from owners and Amanda Stavely is that Eddie Howe impressed a lot in his uh, interviews when he was being interviewed for the head coach's role. And she said when she came out and she spoke to the club's YouTube channel, she said that the thing that impressed her the most, most about Eddie was the fact that he's in, he doesn't fear relegation. He's been in this position before, and we have to realise now as a fan base that we are, we are we are there. We we are bottom of the Premier League, so so chances of us surviving without a win in twelve games the slim to none, and we know that. And would Emery stick around if we were relegated? Probably not. Probably not. Eddie Howe, maybe that person that that knows that the chances of getting relegated are very very high, and he could be the man to to get us straight back out of the Championship and. Me, a lot of people watching this that, that don't really know any Newcastle fans will be shocked that there's Newcastle fans sat here thinking, oh no, we're going to finish in the top 10. It's We're not daft. Like, we're not a daft bunch. We know the position that we're in. And the, we, we sit around, there's four of us that, that normally do this podcast, the, the uh, Gallagher Shots podcast, and we're all under the pressure that we'll, we probably will go down. The, the odds are against us, so we wouldn't be surprised if we got relegated. And Eddie Howe's the man that we want in charge if that was to happen. So I guess the general consensus from an outside perspective is that Newcastle are going to go and spend big in January to try and avoid the drop. Mm. How likely do you think that is? Because, you know, with spending big, it is, you know, it's obviously something that Newcastle can do financially, but it's not going to be that easy to attract players mm -hmm. into a relegation fight, right? So how hopeful are you, though, that, that Newcastle can get the level of player that is needed in that January window, which is notoriously more difficult than the summer one, to be yeah. able to, to increase those chances? It's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be unbelievably hard. But as a fan, I, I don't want these big-name players coming in that aren't going to pull the weight in the likes of a relegation fight, mate. Maybe we do have to, to, to reassess everything. This is a different takeover. This takeover had happened in, in the summer. You're looking at a completely different Newcastle United and, and the players that they're going to be approaching. I think now you probably are looking at those those mid-table Premier League clubs and seeing which players we can snatch from them. Uh, we really are. And I, I think it sounds ridiculous to say this, but obviously with the January transfer window, I think as as owners, they'll probably have to prepare for the worst as well. You can't be bringing these big players in that are just going to pack the bags up and leave if they're going to be relegated. These players that want relegation clauses in the contract, we're going to have to look at thinking which players will probably stick around if we all get relegated and be happy to sit in the championship for, for a year, it'll be an eventful year in the championship, I'll tell you that. But we'll have to prepare for the future. And th there's not many games now until the, the January transfer window and Newcastle have got a few tough games coming up. We've got a few decent games. We've got a couple of back-to-back -back home games as well. But I think we have to prepare. And, and like I said, look at the, the mid-table Premier League clubs and see who we can steal from those. Yeah, no, good stuff. Um, Eddie Howe, um, from what I'm getting from you, you're quite happy with the appointment. You feel like he's someone that fits where Newcastle are at in their journey at this moment in time. What did you make of the performance against Brentford at the weekend? Because to me, it looked like Newcastle were a lot more expansive in the way mm -hmm. that they played. That obviously brings other issues in terms of defensively. I, yeah. I still think they looked a little weak in that uh, part of it. But how much do you think Eddie Howe has change things in the short period that he's been in charge because obviously he wasn't at the game either which wouldn't have been yeah. ideal 
So he had the COVID test on Friday evening. Um, so he obviously tested positive for COVID. So he's missed the next 10, 10 days it was. So he's not even going to be there for, for the Arsenal game at the weekend. His next game is going to be the Norwich game next Tuesday. I think it is. Um, me, I, I was unbelievably impressed by the performance again, Brentford. It's under Steve Bruce. We're not attacking that. We, we are not. We're, we're sitting back and hoping to get a goal. Then, then defend for our lives, mate. Um, you're right what you're saying. It, unbelievably more expensive. And you had players who, who haven't performed really at this football club. So Joe Linton, man of the match, £40 million player, mate, who never looked like that price tag should have been on him. Or fans have always questioned that. And he looked like a different player. And apparently he's been staying back after training to, to spend some time with anyhow and the coaches and, and get more knowledge and insight for how the, 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 that fact well Eddie Howe wants the team to set up which is fantastic as a fan that's exactly what you want to hear that your players are doing um, John Joe Shelby mate I'm probably his biggest critic I, I think he, he's he's came across as a very lazy player um, very lethargical at times at Newcastle United and he looked like a different animal he looked like a, a player with a point to prove and he dominated in midfield barely put a foot wrong to be fair so for, for the likes of those two players to step up their game when we've seen them have performed some shocking performances at St. James's Park was was a breath of fresh air. And going forward, we looked dangerous. We really did. And it wasn't just counter-attacking performances. We, we wanted to keep the ball on the floor. And it's something which we haven't done for a long time. As soon as our defenders get the ball or, or the goalkeeper gets the ball, they normally just kick it out with touch or just kick it up with Callum Wilson. And... When Newcastle United have a game where Callum Wilson hasn't scored a goal, where Callum Wilson hasn't really, he hasn't really shone out, he hasn't been in the spotlight. That's a good thing for us because that players are performing um, defensively. Still shaky. It it has been for a long time now. Fabian Scher came back in, which as a fan base we've been begging for that for a long time because he's probably the only player that can play with the ball at his feet as, as a defender. Um, Jamal Lascelles and Kieran Clark have, have probably. Spent a bit too much time at this football club now. They've been great servants, but it's the old school defender where they just want to lump it, uh, win it in the air, then lump it. Um, if if we want to play football, you can't play those two at the same time. You, you really can't. But me, I, I'm 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 excited to see what this team can do. I, I really am. I think we've won that for for the last couple of seasons with these players. We've got some decent players there, so hopefully now that they've got that freedom to go forward. Yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. And, and you could certainly see that freedom uh, was there uh, on show at St. James's Park at the weekend. Um, I always ask this, Chris, to our uh, mm -hmm. opposition sort of fans, podcasters. Um, what has been your take on Arsenal this season? Because I'm always interested to know how we're perceived yeah. by the kind of wider Premier League sort of fan base. What have you made of Arsenal under Mikel Arteta? And, and, and do you think they are moving in the right direction or are you still not sure? He's, he's took his time, hasn't he? Um, it wasn't the greatest of starts. He has took his time. I think it probably, obviously, the last couple of games for you, is obviously, well, maybe not the last one, but um, the, the being great performance-wise, you have obviously looked better as, as a football club. I think maybe, hopefully, you just have turned the corner because, to be fair, I shouldn't probably be saying this, but I quite like Arsenal. It's probably more toward me, me hatred to, to Spurs, to be fair. Um, <laughs> I've just got, I've got an unnatural hatred towards Spurs and I don't know why. It's you one and of those both, things. but mine's a little bit more natural. Yeah, you've right. got a reason. I don't, I just, <laughs> for some reason, I hate Spurs. So, obviously, when you was going to your derbies and that, I always want, <laughs> want Arsenal to win. Um, but, mate, fingers crossed for you because I think you've been on quite a downward spiral for, for a while now. Um, obviously falling out of the, 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 the top four and obviously they'll, they'll have that mockery at the top six thing and everybody was laughing at the likes of Arsenal and Spurs thinking why are these in the top six but, but hopefully mate, you, your um, your patterns change now and, and you just can go on and, and, and obviously he's on going to challenge for the for the league with the likes of Chelsea running wild and, and even City this year I, I think I'd be shocked if he's doing get Champions League football this season I really would be really? yeah I think your, your curve's going up it really is and you look at other teams, and I think they will struggle. And I think you, you are going well, going forward. You are dangerous. You, you really are. And I think it's the same with any football team. Everybody looks at the defense and, and thinks, oh, like. But it's one of those things. If you score more goals, it doesn't matter how many amount of goals you, you concede, mate. And hopefully, I, I like Arteta as, as a coach as well. And 
I know there was a quite he was getting quite a bit stick from the Arsenal fans, well a section of the Arsenal fans. Um but it was always gonna happen on, on the back of Wenger. Um you, you're yeah. never gonna be happy when Wenger happy when Wenger leaves. Same happened with Man United, didn't it? When Ferguson left, you're always gonna struggle to find that replacement because there isn't a replacement. There isn't a replacement out there. And I honestly I hope he's doing well. I hope he's getting the Champions League. I really do. And I hope we see you there in a couple of seasons' time. <laughs> Listen, I, I hope we get in the Champions League as well. I think I've kind of tempered my expectations a bit and, and mm. kind of said to myself that if we finish in the top six, at least, that would be yeah. a decent season. Top four would be fantastic. But I guess the reason I never had that hope and expectation at the start of the season was I didn't think United would be where United are now. Yeah, uh, I thought the top four was pretty nailed on. The door is slightly open and we could potentially sneak in there, which would be great. I think I look at it slightly differently with Arsenal. I think defensively, we've got a lot better sort of Liverpool mm. side. But at, at, in the other end of the pitch, we, we've got players, but we still seem to lack that little bit of a spark. And hopefully it's a cutting edge, place, isn't it? But, it's a cutting yeah. edge, isn't it? It's obviously it's a lot of, well, Newcastle have been similar for, for years now where you seem to get the chances, but there's never anybody put the ball in the back of the net. Um yeah. Oh, oh, do, you, do you feel as if he was a look in January for a goal scorer? I think it would be nice, but I, I just feel like Arsenal did quite a bit of business in the summer. I'd be very yeah. surprised if they went big in January. I think they're probably looking at, um, you know, the next summer again before we see any significant mm. investment. Hopefully I'm proved wrong, but that's just kind of my uh, my view on it. Um what what can we going back to Newcastle? What can we expect from Newcastle at the weekend? Do you think it'll be more of the same, more of what we saw against Brentford? I would hope to see that. I, I really would. But as a Newcastle United like fan, I've, I've got it honestly. It's burning my brain now that that we sit back and defend. That's that's all I know Newcastle will be as for God knows how many seasons now. And what we saw at Brentford, obviously Brentford are a completely different team to to Arsenal, and obviously we're the away team in this game, but. We need, a, we need points. We need three points, mate. So I'd be very shocked if we do sit back and, and just defend and, and obviously hit on the counter-attack. I would hope to to shock the likes of Arteta and the Arsenal fans and, and go on the front foot because, like I said, mate, we're absolutely desperate. We need to start winning games. We can't just settle for draws. We've had God knows how many draws this season. It's it's not going to be enough. So I honestly think I, I'm... I never thought I'd say this, but I'm I'm looking forward to the game on Saturday. I really am. I might come back and eat my own words here because <laughs> this new Cassie United team, we still really don't know what what their potential is and, and ha- what they can do on a football field because it's been far too long. Where they have been more, the mindset has been more defensive and, and hold out for a draw. But under Eddie Howe, and we saw that Bournemouth, these teams go forward, but they also get hit on the counter attack quite a bit as well. So. It could be one of those games where you, where you see a lot of goals like the Brentford game. It really can because we can score goals. We really can if the players are given the opportunity. If St. Maximum's on his game, we, honestly, he he done that run against Brentford. He picked up at the halfway line. I think he snapped about four players' ankles on the way through. And if he's on his game, then Newcastle can cover a lot of that turf. They really can. Ryan Fraser, obviously, he looked like a different player when he came on. So there's, there's some very, very attacking players in that team who are pacey. They, they really do have a burst of speed in them. So I, I think I'll put my neck on the line, mate, and I, I think you will see a more attacking Newcastle United team. You you really will, hopefully. Yeah, I, I think we will as well. I just think that Eddie Howe, that, that's just his way, right? That's just mm. his way. And, um, and, I think that it will make for a really interesting game because one of the things that I really find frustrating when I go to Emirates sometimes is seeing teams come in and play with a low block. And as I was just saying to you there, I feel like that spark is sometimes missing in this Arsenal side. And my Mm. big fear when teams come and play that way is that we're never going to find a way of breaking them down. We're kind of relying on Arsenal to, you know, produce a moment or or score from a set piece or, or something like that. Whereas, I trust our defence a little bit more now than I have in previous years, which means Mm. I'd like to see us be a little bit more expansive because I think we've got better players in the back four. If Newcastle come and play, I'm sure Arsenal will play them as well and it'll be a bit of a ding-dong and a a good old... uh, a good old contest. So yeah, well, this is what you want as a football fan, though, isn't it? Me, like you want to open expansive football. You really do from both teams. You you want to go to a football game. Great, it's, it's fantastic when you're beating teams three four nil. Of course, it is. 
But you want to be entertained in, in the same manner, don't you? You would love to see an end game, which is why the Brentford game w- would have been great for a neutral. That had a bit of everything there. And obviously Newcastle had a chance to win it right at the end, apart from Joe Linton got his uh, boots stuck in the turf. And it, it's one of those games, mate. And I, I think, like you said, I think it'll be very, very similar to, to Newcastle's last game at the weekend. Obviously, you, you was obviously pissed off on the back of that result as well. So so that, that fears... One of the lads on our podcast, he comes out with a scene which is, is Dr. Newcastle will see you now because Newcastle, <laughs> that team, if a player hasn't scored in 10 games' time, if a team hasn't won, if they haven't scored a cut from a corner, if they haven't scored from a set piece, Newcastle is that team that that's going to happen against, despite how long you haven't done it beforehand. So it's it's one of those, mate. So obviously, use use have a point to prove that, that that does scare us a little bit, but hopefully, hopefully, uh, we, we don't let us do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how this one's going to unfold. But it should be interesting and hopefully an entertaining contest. Um, Chris, thank you so much, mate. Um, really, really appreciate it. Great to have you on. Uh, let people know how they can check out your podcast, how they can keep up with the great work that you do. Yeah, so our podcast, you can find it on all of your podcast platforms on Spotify, iTunes, whoever you download your podcasts from. Um, we do have a YouTube channel as well, which is the Gallagher Shot YouTube channel. You've got around about six, seven videos going out a week now, which which is covering all sorts of stuff. We've got ex-player interviews on there. We've had uh, Ryan Taylor, Dan Goslin last week. Uh, James Perch is joining me in, in a week's time or two weeks' time. So we've got plenty happening, mate. Um, we're, we're really putting the effort in this season. So you, you've got an abundance of content uh, coming your way but yeah um, we're everywhere mate everywhere brilliant stuff make sure you head over and check out the Gallagate Shots podcast another one of the 90 Min podcast network some great content across the network covering a range of different clubs and uh, great to be uh, working alongside Chris and the rest of the guys. We'll be back very, very soon with more Arsenal-related content. Uh, we'll be looking ahead in a little bit more detail, from an Arsenal perspective anyway, to the game against Newcastle United. And of course, on Saturday, we'll be bringing you post-match reaction, followed by a tactical analysis show on Sunday. So lots and lots to come. We'll catch you all very soon. Until next time. Goodbye. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.